All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining to this PCFO webinar. Uh, my name is Joe Flaherty. I'm the Executive Director of Power Clean Future Ohio, uh, and we're joining today to talk about two fantastic grant opportunities, the Energy Futures Grant uh, from the Office of State and Community Energy Programs at the Department of Energy, as well as the Reconnecting Communities and Neighborhoods Program uh, from the Department of Transportation. Um, so Power Clean Future Ohio launched in February of 2020. We work directly with local governments all across the state of Ohio, uh, work with large cities, counties, uh, medium-sized legacy cities all across the state, down to small villages as well, all with a focus on ensuring that they have what they need to pursue clean energy goals uh, and take action on climate change. So uh, hopefully you all are excited to hear about these grants today, and we'll dive right in. We want to make sure we answer all of your questions. Um, how we're going to do that today is we'll uh, go through some uh, slides to talk about uh, each grant one at a time. Melanie will walk through the agenda uh, in detail here in a moment. We'll take uh, 10 minutes between each of those uh, to answer your questions and, of course, encourage open dialogue and uh, exchange of information uh, among you all as you're thinking through this from um, your perspective for your community. So uh, always good to uh, hear and learn from peers uh, along the way as well. So um, with that, I will quickly introduce our team so you all know who you're talking to and then turn it over to Melody. So we have Melanie Nutter, uh, who is, who's our lead technical consultant uh, on our, our technical assistance team. Uh, John Paul Diversa, who's our senior energy policy advisor on our technical assistance team. Uh, Elena Statue, who leads our Northeast Ohio work. Um, for some of you that are in Northeast Ohio, you probably recognize that face, uh, along with Katie Lee, who's also on our technical assistance team as well. So uh, thank you for joining today. And Melanie, I'll let you take it away. Great. Thank you, Joe. And thanks, everybody, for joining us today to talk about these two grants. Um, Katie is going to go ahead and share the slides, and then we will get started. Okay, great. Um, so again, good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to present Power Clean Future Ohio's webinar on two open grant opportunities the Energy Future Grants, and Reconnecting Communities and Neighborhoods. <clears throat> We're very much looking forward to sharing information on these grants and how these resources can directly help advance your climate and equity goals. Next slide. So today's webinar is um, intended to be an orientation to these two programs, um, both of which have deadlines at the end of September. That is why we wanted to squeeze in this webinar just before Labor Day to make sure you all have the information in advance of those deadlines. Um, we will review each program's purpose, the eligibility, potential, potential funding uses, and considerations for competitiveness. Um, we will also leave time after each presentation, as Joe mentioned, um, for all of you to discuss and exchange any ideas that you have around each opportunity, um, whether that's project ideas, teaming ideas, or other questions that you might have. Next slide. So the first um, funding opportunity that we're going to discuss today is the Energy Future Grants. Next slide. Um, so the Energy Future Grant is a two-phase competition that will provide financial and technical assistance to support innovative clean energy planning to benefit disadvantaged communities. Um, EFG is how I will refer it, to it for the rest of the webinar. So EFG seeks to enhance energy affordability and access for communities, ensuring the broad benefits of clean energy do flow directly to disadvantaged communities. And um, really what DOE is looking for is benefits along the lines of of improved health outcomes, increased economic development and jobs, and reduced carbon emissions. Um, EFG will be managed by the newly created Office of State and Community Energy Programs under the U.S. Department of Energy. Um, the plan is for um, this office to distribute $27 million total for EFG. Next slide. So um, EFG will issue awards in two application phases. Um, the current open application is um, for phase one. And again, that is open right now and that deadline is September 30th. Um, EFG plans to provide 50 awards for $500,000 each to multi-jurisdictional teams. Um, how those 50 awards break down is they're anticipating about 35 um, local government-led teams 
about 10 state government led teams and about five tribal led teams. So that's how they're thinking about the 50 awards they're planning to distribute. Um, only successful phase one applicants will be eligible to apply for the phase two, which is the deployment and implementation of the ideas that are um, developed in phase one. So after the phase one awards are announced, um, winners will receive support from technical experts to, again, turn their ideas into solutions that address barriers to clean energy deployment in disadvantaged communities. Um, in phase two, teams will be expected to expand their program partnerships to include community benefit um, organizations and to begin implementation. Next slide. So EFG um, will fund governments to develop and implement plans that are breaking new ground in these three topic areas. Um, applicants are encouraged to think across these sectoral silos and propose multi-sectoral or integrated ideas to improve energy affordability and access, and also to support good jobs and other economic benefits. So again, the, the three main areas um, that they're looking to fund innovative projects in are, um, first of all, transportation, so any planning approaches to reducing energy intensity or greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector, that's the first one. The second is the power sector. So scalable innovations in the power sector that support economic health and job benefits in disadvantaged communities. Um, the third sector is buildings. So innovative strategies for creating net zero commercial and residential buildings. And then again, um, any projects that are cross cutting among either two or three of those sectors, um, applicants are not limited to a single topic area. And again, may propose innovative ideas across all of these topics and DOE is actually encouraging that. So next slide. So who can apply? So for phase one, um, the, app, the prime applicants are limited to states and territories, local government entities, and tribal nations. Um, DOE does recommend that the phase one applications include at least three or four governmental partners. That is one of the reasons that we did also want to have this webinar to see if there are teaming opportunities among any PCFO communities, because um, these applications do um, require multiple government entities to be involved. Um, looking forward to phase two, awardees are expected to expand their project teams to incorporate subrecipients. Um, these subrecipients could include nonprofit entities, institutions, institutions of higher learning, local or regional planning organizations, um, utilities, and for-profit entities as well. Next slide. So one important component of the future energy grants is to develop a community benefits plan. Um, all applicants um, for phase one will be required to create and submit a community benefits plan that outlines how the project will do these four things, um, support community and labor engagement, invest in the American workforce, promote diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, and then contribute to the goals of the Justice 40 initiative. Um, for those of you who have been applying to some of these federal grants, um, you know that the community benefits are, the aim is really to ensure that the benefits of the clean energy transition are shared equitably. Um, applicants are encouraged to submit partnership documentation with established labor and community-based organizations that demonstrate the applicant's ability to achieve the goals of their community benefits plan. Um, applicants will be held accountable for the milestones and the work plan um, that are part of the scope as well. Next slide. So again, just to, to put a little bit finer point on the community benefits um, piece of this application, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, DOE is requiring community benefits plans for all programs funded under the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act um, to have them. So these plans are worth about 20% of the technical merit review of grant proposals. Um, and again, community benefits plans must address the four core principles that we reviewed on the previous slide. Um, DOE also encourages lead applicants to create workforce and community agreements, um, which include any type of formal agreement between a developer, impacted community group, and labor unions. Um, there are a number of organizations. Um, I will mention Reimagine Appalachia in particular, um, as well as Fair Shake, that both have a lot of experience in developing community benefits plans. So um, if anybody wants additional resources and how to put those together, those are two um, good organizations in Ohio, um, in and around Ohio, that would be helpful to um, tap into. Um, so next slide. 
So as I mentioned, DOE strongly recommends um, arrange, uh, arranging teams of at least three to four um, government jurisdictions for phase one and with multiple sector partners for phase two. Um, a teaming partner list is being organized by Department of Energy, which potential applicants can use to explore potential partnerships as well as this call. Um, the teaming partner list is posted and regularly updated on the Clean Energy Infrastructure Exchange, um, which is listed at that website there. Um, to be included on the list, you can email um, the email address that we included there um, with the subject line, creating a community-led energy future, and including all of this basic information, your organization name, email, phone, um, organization type, geographical area of interest, area of technical expertise, and brief description of capabilities. And then you would be um, added to that list for others to be able to access as they're looking for partners. Next slide. Um, so now we'll just take a couple minutes to discuss um, the proposal template and what is required for this application. Um, the good news is that it is a 10 page limit for the narrative. So there's a lot of information that they do want included in the proposal, but there's not a lot of room to develop a very long application. So that actually lowers the bar um, quite a bit to be able to put something like this together in the next four to five weeks. So the five sections that are included in the proposal template, um, the first is the um, project description and opportunity that's uh, about a one to two page li limit, and that would include partners, the project opportunity, um, existing support that you have for the project, um, what the innovation is that you're proposing, as well as the scale of the impact um, that you plan to propose with your project. The next is the community opportunity profile. So that's about two to three pages listing any existing um, partnerships and letters of support from those partners, um, any community input that you've been able to receive in putting this proposal together, um, as well as any technical assistance that you have access to also put this proposal together. Um, the third is the community benefits plan, which I already discussed. That's about two to three pages going over what the benefits would be that would be insured for the disadvantaged communities in particular, as well as the metrics that you would use to um, track those benefits over time. The fourth section is um, around innovation and leveraging other funding. This is a two to three page section where um, you would discuss the innovation ecosystem, what other types of diverse partners that you're working with to implement these ideas, um, how this would scale to other communities, and then any other leveraged funds that you have to um, access for this program or that you plan to pursue. And then the last section is um, one to two pages, but kind of is the nuts and bolts of the proposal around the technical qualifications and summary. So the technical scope, your work plan and tasks, the milestones, project goal, project schedule, and management team and leadership support. Um, I will mention that in the proposal template, they don't call out specifically budget narrative. Um, for this particular proposal, there is a separate um, DOE budget worksheet that's available on their website. Next slide. So here are um, a few tips on um, how to be competitive. So um, applications will be evaluated on the following criteria. Um, successful applicants will need to demonstrate how their proposed projects will achieve and align with these criteria. First and foremost is the opportunity for innovation and, and impact. So the evaluation will be of the merit, the innovation, and the impact of the proposed projects. Um, the second is around project implementation and work plan, evaluation of the project approach and the work plan with a clearly defined project baseline, metrics, and deliverables. Um, the third piece that will be evaluated is the um, diversity and breadth of the partner team, as well as the resources that you're able to leverage for the work, um, evaluation of the political or institutional support that the team um, lead has secured, and then finally, the community benefits plan that we discussed. Um, I will mention that DOE did call out in one of their webinars that they're not interested in technologies that have not been tested um, and as well as um, and, and demonstrated. So they do want technologies that have uh, that are common in the marketplace, um, but the innovation could come either from how those technologies are deployed or how you put together a multi-sector, cross-sector um, proposal for um, for the work. Next slide. Oh, sorry about that. 
Um, so uh, last piece is on, on how to apply, and then we'll take some time for discussion. Um, so a couple of things to do if you're interested in pursuing this particular grant opportunity. Um, join, again, the DOE's teaming list and review the existing teaming list to find application partners. Um, obtain a control number that must be included in the header of each application page. So a control number will be issued when an applicant begins the application process on the Clean Energy Infrastructure Exchange, and we included the link on a previous slide. Um, the third is to submit your application um, to the DOE Clean Energy Infrastructure Exchange by September 30th, that's at 5 p.m. Eastern, um, and then Again, one, one tip is DOE is asking for applications to be submitted a day or two in advance to avoid any um, technical glitches, as well as to avoid um, the, uh, um, uploads taking a long time. Um, the last piece that I'll mention is there is a very quick turnaround time for this grant. They are expecting to provide um, the selections by end of November, and the expected award date um, or the, sorry, expected date for award negotiations is the end of the year. So the good news is that if you apply, um, there will be a very quick turnaround for this funding being um, deployed. Um, so our next grant that we um, wanted to discuss with all of you today is the Reconnecting Communities and Neighborhoods Program. Um, this is a U.S. Department of Transportation program that we will go into more detail on. Next slide. Great, thank you. Um, so the Reconnecting Communities and Neighborhoods Program aims to advance community-centered transportation connection projects and provide technical assistance to further these goals. Um, overall, the program has $198 million allocated. So um, RCN, which is the joint name for the Reconnecting Communities Pilot and the Neighborhood Access and Equity Programs, um, if applicants meet the requirements for both programs, they are encouraged to submit one application for both funding opportunities. Um, admittedly, this, this um, grant opportunity is a little bit more complex than the Energy Future Grants, but we will do our best to describe um, the various components to this grant. Next slide. Um, RCN has three grant types and two grant programs. Um, this structure may be a little confusing, but we've tried to, again, make the distinctions as clear as possible throughout the presentation. But please feel free to ask any questions in the chat as I'm going along for clarification. And Katie and others can help to chime in if you have um, questions as we go. So first, um, let's review the three grant types. Um, the first is community planning. So projects including planning activities for future construction projects. The second grant type is capital construction, um, construction projects that replace an existing transportation facility with those that reconnect communities, um, decrease pollution and or mitigate environmental harm. And the third is um, regional Partnerships Challenge, which are projects led by two or more applicants that include the same activities as the capital construction and community planning, planning grants, but they have a regional focus. So these three grant types are split across two programs. Um, the community planning and capital construction grants are applicable to both grant programs. However, applications for the Regional Partnerships Challenge will only be considered under the Neighborhood Equity and Access Program. Next slide. Um, so now let's discuss the eligible applicants. So under the Reconnecting Communities Pilot Program, eligible applicants vary by grant type. Um, for the community planning grants, eligible applicants include states, local governments, tribal governments, metropolitan planning organizations, and nonprofit organizations. Those are all um, the eligible prime applicants. For uh, capital construction grants, eligible applicants include um, owners of the eligible facility um, or a partnership between a facility owner and any eligible RCP community planning applicant. Um, under the Neighborhood Access and Equity Grant, eligible applicants are the same for all three grant types, and those include a state or territory, local government, political subdivision of a state, tribal government, special purpose district or public authority with a transportation function, a metropolitan planning organization, a nonprofit organization or institution of higher education that has partnered with an above eligible entity. Next slide. 
Um, so now we will transition to um, the eligible grant activities. Um, for the community planning grants, applicants to both the RCN and the NAE programs may use funds for public engagement, planning studies, or other planning activities. Those are really the focus of um, those particular grant activities. In addition to these uses, the NAE applicants may use funds for um, planning and capacity building activities in disadvantaged or underserved communities, planning studies to assess the feasibility of removing or retrofitting a burdened facility, um, transportation equity or pollution impact assessments, um, or technical assistance activities as well. Next slide. Um, for the capital construction grants, it is a similar format where there are um, shared base activities for RCN and NAE grants um, and additional el eligible activities for NAR applicants. Um, applicants to the RCN and the NAE may use funds for preliminary design activities, environmental studies, pre-development permitting or NEPA planning processes for um, the removal or retrofit of dividing um, of a dividing transportation facility, the replacement of a dividing transportation facility, and delivering community benefits and mitigation of impacts identified through the planning process. Um, in addition to these activities, NAE applicants can also design and um, planning processes that address um, the reuse of a transportation facility to improve walkability and safety, projects that mitigate or remediate negative impacts from a burdening facility, um, building or improving complete streets, multi-use trails, greenways, or active transportation networks, um, or providing affordable access to essential destinations like transit and public spaces. And um, a little bit of the discussion that we had um, between the two grants, I think certainly would apply um, for some of the projects that were discussed during our break for these sections. Um, next slide. So finally, um, all activities under the previous two grants are eligible for the Regional Partnership Challenge grant. Grant, excuse me. Um, the key differentiator is that these applicants will be a partnership or, of two or more eligible entities to tackle persistent regional equitable access um, and mobility challenges. Next slide. Um, so there are some matching requirements for this grant, which we'll go over very briefly. Um, so for the RCP community planning grant, there is a 20% local matching requirement. Um, for the RCP capital construction grant, there is a matching requirement of 50%. However, other sources of federal funding may be used to provide a portion of the match, um, bringing the requirement down to 20%. And for all three grant types under the NAE, there's a 20% matching requirement. However, for projects located in disadvantaged communities, there is no local match requirement. So that's one important um, piece to note about the matching um, requirement. Next slide. Um, okay, so next we will go over the seven merit criteria that will be used to evaluate applications. Um, competitive applicants will be able to demonstrate how their approach and project can meaningfully ex um, advance their program goals. There are not specific scores or weights for each criteria um, listed by Department of Transportation, but instead DOT is encouraging applicants to design projects that score highly in as many areas as possible. And these include equity and environmental justice, um, addressing harmful historic or current policies, existing socioeconomic disparities, um, environmental disparities, the needs of the surrounding community, and how proposed solutions equitably distribute benefits and mitigate impacts. Um, that's the first criteria. The next one is around access. So addressing new or improved context sensitive affordable transportation options, um, safe accommodation for all users and seamless integration with the surrounding factors um, and encouraging thriving communities with transportation choices that don't require a car. The third is um, facility suitability. So removing barriers to access, mobility and economic development, um, addressing environmental burdens on communities um, and or addressing current and um, projected vulnerabilities. 
And then the last piece is around community engagement and community-based stewardship, management, and partnerships, um, facilitating meaningful engagement using a community-centered approach, establishing formal partnerships, and or deferring to a representative community advisory group. So that's really the complete holistic picture of what they would like um, these applications to address. Next slide. Um, so there, um, those were, the, sorry, those were the first four. Now we have three additional to add um, to make the very complete picture, which is um, also making sure that you are looking at equitable development, prioritizing community restoration, stabilization, and anti-displacement, creative placemaking, and or local regional state equitable development planning, um, climate and environment. So reducing transportation related pollution, um, providing high quality, low carbon travel choices and or supporting a climate action plan for lower greenhouse gas emissions. Um, workforce development and economic opportunity is the last one, addressing local inclusive economic development and entrepreneurship and support for good paying jobs and high quality workforce development programs. Um, because there, that is a lot, and those are all of the, um, the merit criteria that Department of Transportation will be looking at, um, I do think that it is possible that you could meet four or five of these and still have a competitive application. If you have a proposal that meets all seven, of course, that would be most ideal. Um, but this is very comprehensive of being able to um, provide all of these benefits to the community through your proposal. Next slide. So how to apply. So the proposal template, this is what is required. Um, so the first is the key information table, which is two to three pages. This is a pre-formatted table that has basic questions to gather information on the application type, um, your eligibility, as well as the proposal summary. Um, this application is slightly longer than the other one that we um, just discussed. So the project narrative is um, 10 to 20 pages, depending on the grant type. The primary objective for the project narrative is to state your case for the merit criteria, um, including an overview, a project location and map, response to the merit criteria, project readiness that does um, also look at environmental risk for grants that include construction and a benefit cost analysis um, for capital construction grants. Um, the third component for the applications is the budget. So in the budget, you should also demonstrate how you will utilize matching grant funds. Um, and then the last piece of the application is a project location file. This file will be used to verify disadvantaged community and urban rural status. Um, DOT provides instructions on how to save this file in the NOFO. Next slide. So finally, how to apply some key considerations. Um, you do want to ensure that you have your UEI number um, with SAM.gov. Um, if you've already started applying for federal grants, hopefully this is well taken care of and you have this already. Um, but if, you, the, if you're new to applying for federal grants, that's something to start right away. Um, register with um, Valid Eval, which is the third party platform that's used by US Department of Transportation for um, these grant applications, and then submit your application to Valid Eval by Thursday, September 28th at midnight. Um, they do not want you to apply through grants.gov for this. So um, again, this is a very similar timeline to the Energy Future Grants that we just talked about. They're both due within a couple of days of each other. Um, so wanted to make sure that we covered all of these um, grant opportunities with you all today. So thank you for joining for today's uh, informational webinar on uh, these two fantastic grants that may be helpful for your community in pursuing your clean energy, clean transportation, and climate goals. Um, if you do have any questions, I know there's some uncertainty about whether some folks are going to pursue this uh, one or both of these uh, grants. Please follow up with us for any uh, questions that we can help clarify or if there's any direct support we can provide you as outlined uh, by my colleague Elena. But uh, thank you again for, uh, for being on here today, and we will follow up with both the slides and the recording uh, afterwards. I hope you all have a great rest of your Thursday.